Good morning. Good morning. This is April 24th, 2000, here in Natick, Massachusetts. This is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. And this morning we have with us Harold Aronson. Good morning, Harold. Good morning. I understand they call you Harry. At Can I call you Harry as we go through this? Sure. Okay. First thing I'd like to ask is, uh, how old are you? 77. 77, and what is your current address? Natick. You live here in Natick, and your marital status? Yes, married. Uh, do you have children, Harry? Yes, two. And grandchildren? Two. Well, let's try for three. Do you have any great-grandchildren? No. <laughs> okay, and where were you born, Harry? In Boston, Children's Hospital. Okay, and where were you raised? Where Revere. Did you in Revere? Mm -hmm. Revere Beach. And how long did you stay there? 20 years. And can you tell us something about your dad and mom, your family life? Uh, my dad was a printer, worked for the Ritz Carlton Hotel. He did all their printing for them, all their sweet cards and mailing lists and menus. And uh, he passed away very young. He was 44 years old in 1942 from a blood clot. And my mother lived here quite a while after he was gone. Then she moved to California with my brother. And she, he passed away in 1970. And uh, when did you first come out to Natick? 1960. Okay, what brought you out here from Revere? Well, some, I didn't live in Revere before Natick. I lived in Brighton. I see. First, I, well, when I got married, I lived in Boston in the West End. From Boston, I moved to Brighton, the Veterans Housing Project. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we friends of ours had moved, and we looked in Natick, and we kind of liked what we saw. So we've been in the same house now almost 40 years. Okay, so you moved out here in 60. So you moved out here after you had been in the service, is that after, correct? After, yes. Okay. Um, <coughs> can you tell us where you were in the early 1940s then? The early 1940s, I worked in the Watertown Arsenal. I could have got deferred because of being in the working for the government, but all my friends were enlisting, so I enlisted in the, at that time was the United States Air Force. Mm -hmm. Now it's, I guess, it's just the Army Air Force. But what, I, what kind of work did you do in the arsenal while you were there? I was a machinist there. I did the machine, we worked in machine shop and running various machines. So you had skills that the, the armed skills. forces would really want. Mm -hmm. Now yes. tell us about enlisting. You say your friends went in? My, most of my friends went in service and I, I went in and uh, on my own. In Boston? In Boston. At the time they were advertising that they wanted people to enlist and pick out the trade that you wanted and where you want to stay. But they, I want to stay in the States, but they sent me to over England for two and a half years. But this was in 42? In 42, December yeah. 42. Okay, that's a, one year after Pearl Harbor you went into the uh, mm, service. Right, correct. Uh, why did you pick that particular branch? I don't know, somehow or other, the, I liked the Air Force, I liked the way they did things, and I also wanted to do mechanical work, airplane engine mechanic. Did you have your choice of service you could go into? Uh, most likely I did. At the time of enlisting, they gave us a choice. But somehow the Air Force appealed to me, so I figured that was the thing to be in. Okay, and when, when you went into the service, uh, did you go in by yourself or were some friends with you? Or, no, I was uh, drafted. I was enlisted rather from Fort Devens. Yeah. And I guess there were some others that had gone the same time. Guys that you knew? Not my own friends, no. no. I only made acquaintance of them when I went in there. Okay, so you're <coughs> a, a Boston young man. Um, you're saying goodbye to your family, and you're going into the armed forces. Mm. You were sent out to Fort Devens here in Massachusetts. Right. Tell us about that. Went there for my basic training, and then they uh, shipped me out of there once I got it over, I guess it was to uh, New Jersey to, for selection, and then they went, I went to Miami Beach. Okay, w one step at a time. Yeah, right. Tell us about basic training. What what? Was that an eye-opener for you? Well, somewhat. I mean, it's something was something different, you know, and I, 
I got to know the general rules of the or whatever of the Army and the Air Force. This is in the middle of the winter. Uh, was it tough being out there then? Yeah, a little bit, but uh, I didn't stay there too long before they sent me to other places. Okay, now when, when you were at Devon's, was it decided there that you would be a mechanic or did you go to some schools first? I had to go to school for it. Okay, where did you go? In Detroit, Michigan, Ford Aircraft plant. In uh, Detroit, or what was it, Dearborn. Dearborn, Michigan, mm -hmm. where they had the Ford Rotunda and they trained me on the radial engine to do mechanical work. Who made those engines? Was the Pratt Whitney or? Uh, I think it was Pratt Whitney. Studebaker made a radial engine at that time. And, yeah. And uh, we were trained on the, to go, to you how to handle them, what to do. Tell us about that, that you go into this huge complex and they say you're gonna work on engines. What, what specifically did you do? How did they teach you? Well, they had a school to teach you how to use uh, magnetos that came to the engine. They t taught you how to use a magnaflux machine that could detect minute cracks through the use of lead in the liquid that magnified all this. And they could tell if there was, the engines were able to be saved or not. And that's what I did most of the time, that I, that I wasn't trained for it. To know just to hone out piston cylinders and and different types of work there that I could do. Was this hard work? It was kind of a little tough because I was what, younger. What were the hours in school? I don't I don't recall too much on the hours, but but you 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 have a recollection of it was pretty hard work. Well, it was tough to you know get, and I was younger, of course. I didn't mind it as much. Yeah. Hmm. And how long uh, did you stay in Detroit? Excuse me, Dearborn. About, about five months. So this takes you up to maybe June of uh, 43? Yeah, June of 43, right. And then from there they, sh they shipped me to, uh, to England, to an Air Force base. So you went right from school overseas, is mm. that correct? Uh, before you went overseas, did the... Um, Air Force take you aside and say you're going into a different culture, you're gonna, this is what you should know about how to behave or where you're going or what their customs mm. are. Right, they all. Tell us about that. That's what they showed, of course I don't recollect too much of it, but I know there was, uh, they showed, you know, taught us what to do and how to handle ourselves and you know, what, where to be and how to dress and the usual things that, that you might know. you. Air Force people would know about. How did you get to England? The uh, Queen Mary. You sailed over uh, on, the Queen, on the, Mary. the Queen Mary mm. with how many other guys? No, oh, there was 18,000 of us. They put quite a few of us in a stateroom that normally would take two people. It might have been about five or six or eight of us in a stateroom and slept on bunks or hammocks, whatever they had. Yeah. And it sailed, took five days to get to England. Where did you sail from? From. Uh, I'll show you where, where I imagine it would be. Hmm. I think it was, I don't think it was from Boston. I think it was from probably New Jersey. Maybe out of the port of Newark, something like no, that. No, in Newark or somewhere. Yeah. I don't recall too much where we departure from. Okay, you're sailing overseas in wartime on a pretty big target. How did you, how did you feel on those five days? Seasick. <laughs> <laughs> I always get seasick all, all the way. Were you alone or in a convoy? Uh, I guess they had convoys with us, but uh, we were, you know, going by a, on our own, of course, and, you know, it's, things were different and new and we didn't realize, you know, what we had. Did you see any ships around you as you went over? Uh, occasionally there'd be a destroyer or something yeah. around. How about aircraft protection? Mm, not too much. I didn't see too much of that. And did you know where you were going? Uh, I think they mentioned that we'd be heading to England. Hmm. Okay, where did you land over there? Uh, and I'm not sure exactly. I know it was we went to the Watton Air Force Base. Watton, England. That was a base I was at. And now you, you are with the fellows you were with in school. You, you weren't all alone by yourself on that ship. Hmm. 
you knew some of the fellows who were Some of them from the school, right. Can you tell us where Wharton is? It's uh, right in St. England. I'm not sure if it's north or south. Or some section, one section of England. I'm not definitely sure. It was a long time ago. And this is June in England, which is a lovely time to be there. What were your impressions of landing over there? It was nice, but 95% of the time was rainy, damp, foggy. Yes, really. Uh, you walk around England, you could actually, when they said pea soup fog, they meant it because the London fog is very thick and you could walk in the street and bump into people and not even know it. Now you're on an air base? An air base. And you are, are immediately doing what you were trained to do? Is Some of it, To yes. work on engines? Mm. Uh, what Describe, can you, like a typical day of what you did over there? Well, it was not always uh, available to, you know, to have the work done. And only when the planes come in, we're supposed to inspect the engines, uh, check how they were. People took certain parts of off. We'd have put in a honing machine, clean out the cylinders. We'd uh, <coughs> used to put the parts in, like I mentioned, the Magnaflux machine, certain parts, to see if there's any small, minute cracks, mm -hmm. and we could tell just what it was doing there. And of course, when there wasn't anything doing, they'd give us other work to driving, they would different other jobs they could put you on, and special services, which I, I was I did a lot over there as well. What does that mean? When I was in the entertainment department. I used to travel, I was a, another friend and I met, played the guitar, and I'm a harmonica player, and we traveled around England entertaining at different bases. We got no pay for it, but it was just a meal and just something to go around. So I did a lot of that over there as well. How much did you do of that, uh, other than your, your work as a, a mechanic? Oh, at least 50%. Really? Mm. Tell us how much traveling you did. Oh, it was quite around all over England. I went to London, Manchester, Norwich. I went to uh, Northampton, Southampton, uh, Coventry, which was the, of course, three years ago, the famous Lady Godiva did a famous horseback ride. And I was in there after the bombing. And of course, the troops had left then, and we went in in a convoy, and we saw all the aftermath of devastation that was at the, was supposed to be the most bombed out town in England. And it was quite an experience for that alone. And then of course other times I was in the motor pool and they, you know, if they had a fill in and do things, get things rolling, they'd we'd just be stationed in the garage or whatever and then they'd call us to do certain trips. And uh, we'd, we called, you know, to go all around Ipswich and all and take people to bases or hospitals and whatever. When, when you worked on airplanes, I'd like to draw a distinction here. Did you have anything to do with the air crews themselves or did you just work on planes? Just on the planes itself. So you had no idea who was flying them or who would I never was up on a plane. Them. I not only wasn't up one, I never got in a plane. It's always Never, we put together some Piper Cub engines into the motor, and they wanted us to go up with them to try them. We wouldn't go. We, we tried. We, just, we didn't <laughs> want to. That's pretty take, small, yeah. Yeah, small little plane. I said, we don't know. Thanks. We didn't what, want to. What go. other planes did you work on? B 24, 56, B 26, the big bombers. How about 17s? Not that much. Not too much in the pursuit planes. More the the bombers, and uh, we did some of that. So you were, if you had 26s and 24s, you had, had big uh, planes and the medium big planes. Big engine yeah. planes, right. How about any fighters, anything uh, single engine? Not too much, you know, no. No, mostly the big bombers. And, and then we used to go in the room, we used to test the engine, and that noise would really deafen you. You could really ruin your, in fact, the one of my ears got uh, partial hearing loss because of being in the, uh, in the Air Force and whatever, and I got compensated for that. I still have the hearing loss, but I just hear it's a good one. So. Let's put something together here. Um, 
it's raining all the time and it's thick fog all the time. How did these guys fly? They managed to get up, a lot of time it was just fog, mist, and they seemed to get up off the ground in enough time. They had enough clear weather to, to get in through it. Now, was this an operational base where they would go off on bomb runs? I imagine, yeah. I, I, I think in your papers, I've got you were the 8th Air Force, 100th Bombardment Group. Mm -hmm. Is that the one you stayed in right. for your career in England? Correct. So you, you were working on planes that were taking off and going on bombing raids? Bombing raids, right. Do you have any idea where they went or so where the operational strikes were? I never uh, really uh, never really got into that. I never you know, followed their flight plans or whatever. I didn't have any idea. In the old movies you see of, of the time you were over there, mm. there's always these pictures of everybody scattered along a runway waiting for the planes to come back. Were you part yeah. of that vigil? No, no, we weren't on that at all. We were just in the, in the hangars mm -hmm. whenever possible, and we'd work on the engines when, we, uh, when they would put one in. In other words, they'd take them off the plane. We wouldn't even, I don't think I ever saw the runway really much because we weren't in you different were sections. You were removed out over in the machine right. shops. We were just in the yeah. one they brought them in, and we'd see just what, what we had to do to them. Yeah. What was, um, I'm not sure how to phrase this, but what was the most common thing wrong with the planes that came to you, the Just engines? Just the engine wear. Just wear and tear, Wear and tear, wear and tear of the engine, any, right. any time an airplane had been shot up? Well, some of them had, but we didn't, uh, we didn't get that much to do with it. Okay. Because we didn't, we weren't an airplane mechanic, it was an airplane engine mechanic. So we didn't have anything to do with the rest of the plane at all. Okay. Um, you mentioned Coventry and mentioned uh, Southampton, of course. These places were pretty heavily bombed. Tell, right. tell me uh, about your impression seeing what was left of that cathedral there mm. or the waterfront at Southampton. What, what did you feel about this? Oh, it looked pretty devastating. It's something that, you know, you, you don't uh, forget very easily. And it's, you know, it was just a mound and something you could see what, what they have there. But uh, as far as uh, seeing the bombing itself, we never saw any bombing. We saw the aftermath of yeah. bombings. Which is pretty, pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Did you talk to the British people? Oh, plenty, yeah. Get to know any families over there? Mm -hmm. I planted and they invited me. There's a couple of families I met, they invited me for dinner rabbit or squirrel, whatever they were making, because they couldn't get too much regular yeah. meat, they had horse meat. Tell and us about going into a British home in Coventry. I didn't go into a British home in Coventry. In England, I went into a British home. I met a girl there in town, and she invited me to a house for dinner. And, you know, and it was, uh, uh, they welcomed me, and they gave me a nice dinner. And afterward, they, they, in fact, they gave me a cup of tea afterward. And they wanted to put milk. I said, no. I said, well, in the United States, a lot of people don't drink milk and tea. I said, we, they never heard of it. They, I, I said, we drink it with lemon. So I, they tried it, and they liked it. And they didn't, couldn't imagine drinking tea other than with milk in it. In fact, some of the restaurants in town have the tea in the milk, mixed with milk already in the urn, like we have coffee. Yeah. <clears throat> And in fact, I went to a, uh, one of the girls I met in London, went to a uh, show, her uncle was a comedian at Hanley, and uh, she, she told me that, uh, they, they even said the, the reason that English drink so much tea because I've tasted their coffee. And so it's a little different. <laughs> that may be true. Yeah. They and, had uh, been at war for four years by the time you got over there. What did they think about, uh, did they think it's ever going to end or thank God the Yankees are here? Yeah, the Yankees are coming, but you know, they, they always just say after the, after the war, who's going to rule the world, the American or the, or the British? <laughs> As well, I said, that's a question of not to do with us at all. I said, it's just it's nothing to rule anything. I said, we just get along as, as allies and work that out okay. So. I met a lot of English people. I ate a lot of fish and chips, wrapped in newspaper, and I queued up and I rode the bus and the pram and the tram, and I got to know all the 
their language and their ways. I was over to uh, Piccadilly Circus. In London. In, in yeah. London. Mm -hmm. And that time the big statue was, was boarded up. I didn't really get to see it. And I would have liked to have gone back someday, but I never, never did with myself or the wife. It's still there. Still there, <laughs> yeah. right. And I was all around, and you know, I walked to Hyde Park in London, and and I went to the cinema, and saw movies that we had seen here three or four years earlier, and they they just got them over there and under a different name. So it was quite an experience itself. It must have been. Uh for you, uh, a Boston man, a, a Yankee over there in wartime London, mm. can you describe some of London or your f recollections of what it was like? Well, there's a lot of historical places there, and you know, and Trafalgar Square, and then going down through, uh, you know, the different areas of, around Bellingham, uh, Bur Bellingham, no, I mean, the, what is it, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the head office there, not Bellingham, Birmingham or whatever they call it. Whitehall? Yeah, and all that area. Yeah. And uh, knowing that I was right in the same place that most of the people had mm -hmm. seen before. Did you ever see anybody uh, famous or any generals that you had read about? Not really, no, no. no. How did you know what was going on in, in the war while you were... Uh, not necessarily just in your machine shop, but on your base. On the base. Well, he kept us notified with the paper, the Stars and Stripes, mm -hmm. and that gave a good account of what was doing, what was going on. So uh, that's what we kept posted on it. But we did get, in D-Day, I don't know if I'm going ahead of myself or not, but... No, that's fine. They were D-Day, they did transfer us to the infantry. But before we really had much time to spend in the infantry, we got transferred back to the Air Force. The war got over, and then we got shipped back to the States. Okay, then stop right there. On, on the 6th of June of 1944, you, an aircraft mechanic, were taken into the infantry? Mm. Tell, tell me how that happened. Well, they needed some more bodies, some more people, you know, help, and, fighting, we didn't, uh, I didn't even go in to fight or anything, I just went in, they just transferred us in, but it was after D-Day, and then when they, they straightened things out and you know, had their surrenders or whatever they did, we went back right into the, did I you, think, Did you go to France? No, no, I st still stayed in England. Were, were you given infantry training? We were given some basic training and all in the infantry, but yeah. we, uh, we didn't uh, get a chance to even Go overseas. We we're supposed to go to Germany, but what well. was your feeling about that? That you had been in uh, the Air Force side of the the war, and for at least a short time, you were suddenly infantry. Mm. What did you feel about that? Well, it's a completely different feeling. You know, something was uh, altogether different. But we didn't. I uh, didn't get in to do any any ba shooting or battle or whatever it was. We just, uh, I don't remember, even remember, to tell you the truth, how long it was that I was in the infantry. But I know it was quite a short time because before we knew it, we were back in the Air Force. And the same mustered, base. And mustered out to yeah. the state, back to the States. Okay, while you were on that base, um, did you re meet people other than British? Did you, all the other Allied forces had their own Air Forces. Did you I meet any French Scottish, or Polish or something like that? A few Scottish, a few Polish, not, not so much Polish, but Scottish and uh, Irish, Italian, because they were prisoners. We were uh, Italian prisoners of war. In fact, they were trading bottles of whiskey for cotton cigarettes. And after we got in, we found out we weren't drinking whiskey, but it looked like whiskey was cold tea. <laughs> well, they were fake cigarettes. Fake, <laughs> yeah, fake cigarettes. Could give them fake cigarettes, right? And uh, you know, and then when I they brought in some German prisoners of war, well, I was like a translator because being J Jewish, the very similar to the German language, mm -hmm. so I could interpret something somewhat for them that didn't know how to talk to the Germans. Okay. So 
How did how did you run into the, into the POWs if you were in your machine shop? Were you, were well, you then, taken out for special uh, services? They brought us. They brought them over, you know, and they were, of course, they were in, over in the prison section, but they could, some of them we could walk around, or we could talk to them. On yeah. your base. Mm. Yeah. And what did you what did you what transpired between you and the Germans? What was said? What were you looking for? Oh, nothing much. Just a similarity of language. We didn't uh, actually hadn't had anything to do with them. We didn't eat with them, or we didn't play uh, sports or anything like that with them. It just we were, could talk to them once occasionally. Did you do this officially? No, as no, part of an official, interrogation no, no. or anything like that. No. Wasn't an official uh, okay. job. It just. When you were over in England, where it rained all the time and it was foggy, quite do you, a bit. Right do you bit. feel you you were properly clothed? Did you have? Uh, you had to carry a raincoat with us at all times, because yeah. you never knew when it was. One time we were out in a field and it looked like a nice sunny day, and everything was good, and it was just started to rain a little bit, and everybody took out the cigarettes to have a smoke under the tree, and they were all wet because of the rain. I had a cigarette case, and I opened it up, and blob of rain came right in the middle, <laughs> so nobody had to smoke. At that time, most everybody was smoking. Yeah. And, uh, you know, according to what we would do there. I think the papers, I, I read a little bit about you before today. Um, it, the, and the quote is, when I was in the north, they bombed the south, and when I was in the south, they bombed the north. Right. Uh, did you come upon the results of a bombing shortly after it happened or anything like after, that? After, yes, aftermath. Right. Tell us about that. Well, when we, like I say, mainly in Coventry, more so than other parts of the country, that we saw the bombing afterward. And, in fact, the the girls that were going, you know, seeing the soldiers that were that had shipped out, we came after it with a convoy, and they were all jumping all over our trucks and everything else because they were happy to see some Yanks, American soldiers, at the time. So we uh, we noticed everything that was going on there, but we didn't stay very long. I guess we just came in to bought some weapons, some supplies, or whatever it was. When you traveled all over England as uh, with your harmonica, um, mm. have you any place that you can remember more than any other that you thought you might ever want to go back to? Mm. London, I liked you know quite a bit, mm -hmm. but at that time they were, of course, you know, was, things was bombed, quiet out. They were, they hadn't had the same uh, feelings. In fact, just used to call us Yank and Yank and all those, and we met some of them that, you know, weren't too were friendly, but enough, but not that much. I spent two and a half years over there, 30 months. Were there blackouts every night? There were blackouts, oh yeah. Every quite night? A few. Mm. Well, yeah, you had to be careful, you know, it's a little lighting or cigarettes or whatever. Mm. Right. Do you feel that the officers you had uh, leading you or, or supervising you uh, were well trained for their jobs and that they treated you well? Or how did they, uh, yeah, they seem what's to, your opinion of them? Well, they seem to be pretty good, you know. And, uh, <coughs> there was a few that was, uh, you know, that was pretty good to us and they took care of us. In fact, one of them that, uh, one holiday was a Jewish holiday at the time, and some people, local Jewish people, invited us to their home for dinner. And of course, the people who were non-Jewish were ridiculing us because of the fact that we got invited and they didn't. It was our holiday, and the commander didn't like it. In fact, his name was McLeod. I still remember his name. And he told anybody that he caught doing that was going to be court-martialed. Doing what? because they were ridiculing the fact that we were going out to somebody's house for dinner mm -hmm. yeah. and that they didn't include them. As well, at Christmas time, they had got invited and they didn't seem to think that, you know, we'd, well, we'd put up a fuss about that. Yeah. When you went to somebody's home, uh, mm. were you able to bring them any uh, food or anything like that? Well, mostly that? the things that they needed, rations, that's what they were, you know, like uh, 
they like chewing gum or chocolate or anything like that that they couldn't get very much of. So we used to help out once in a while. Hmm. Who were your closest friends in the service? Oh, I don't know. There was a. Yeah, I can't think of the names too much. Benson, I know, it was one fellow Benson, and another one Albanese. I don't remember too much of the others. There, there was different, few others that were. Oh, another fellow, Jack Cohen from Brooklyn, New York. In fact, he told me when he get out, to look him up. And of course, when I, he didn't say where he lived or whatever. And I go to one time I got to New York, I'm looking up at Jack Cohen at about 500. Yeah. And I wouldn't, wouldn't done any good. <laughs> yeah. Any any other anybody else you ever stayed in touch with over the years? Uh, not really, not too much. Uh, a couple of us, in fact, went AWOL one time when we got into the infantry. We were going to get supplies, and there's two fellas, one from New York, and one of them, I think the name was Bloomfield or some name like that. And I didn't have any money to go, and he loaned me twenty dollars. When I got out. We got and still got an honorable discharge. They didn't put it down as a, it was only a couple of days, but we got sick of doing that infantry stuff. So they all, we took off and they come back and they, he gave me the money. And I, when I got out of service, I, uh, I wrote to him. I found his address and wrote to him and tell him I still remember the $20. I never got an answer. So I figured, well, either he got killed or something. And as far as today, I still owe him the $20. <laughs> Well, that's for another world. Nah. When you went AWOL, why did you go AWOL? Oh, the three of us got together. We were kind of fed up with the infantry training they were giving us, and we didn't like it, so that we, the three of us decided one of us was going to get some passes, the other one was going to get some rations, and some get some food. We all went our separate ways, and then we met back at London in the train station, went back to camp and got reprimanded, but we didn't... Uh, he just says, you guys are, are outfitted, shipped out to Germany. And we couldn't go because we, you know, we're kids, we're young people, and we didn't, we didn't get, uh, get a mark against our records. Still got an honorable discharge. About what time was that? Uh, 45, say? I'd say around 45, around Well, 45. you were in the infantry around D-Day. That's 44. Yeah, 44, 45, right. Okay. And you'd been over there, what'd you say, two and a half years? Yeah, I went there, let's see, uh, let's see, December, around June, must have been around June or July. Let's see, 30 months, because I was eight months in the States, so I must have gone over there around uh, July, August. Must have been around July, I'd say. And uh, stayed there until February 46, when we got came back to the States. So that you were still over there during the, the so-called Battle of the Bulge, mm. did you hear about that? We knew about yeah. it, yeah. What did you think? The Germans are making a breakthrough just when you thought right. the war was over? Right, right. You must have watched that one very closely. Oh, yeah. We were kept well aware of it. We were, and we were alerted to whatever was going on. And then you got into the spring campaigns, and it was your base very busy? There's a lot of bombing going on yeah. that spring. They kept busy. We were in a warehouse. We used to see them, you know, bringing in the uh, jackets with the servicemen that get, you know, into bombings and bloodied up jackets. People would try to get the jacket. There was leather jackets, the fur collars or the pilots used to wear. We tried to get them, but they, most of them were messed, too messed up to get any of them. Yeah. We figured we used to bring them into salvage, you know, whatever. And then the war ended. Mm. This is May of 45. And where were you? Still there, still in England. And we're waiting to, you know, to get transferred What back. do you think, though, that the war is over and... Well, we were happy, of course, you know, like anybody else, it's of the surrenderings and all. Big celebration on your base? Yeah, they had the yeah. celebrations and all, you know, and everybody was happy, but we were just as happy to get back home well, immediately, your thought now is, when, when are we going home? Were you under the point system? Point system, right. So many, forget how many points, 59 points or something, according to how many points you had to get shipped home first, Yeah. sooner or later, with whatever medals you might have had or whatever citations, and they got 
commendations or whatever. So you had to wait till 46, is that right? 46, yeah. Yeah. February, I think it was February 1st or 4th or something like that, or February 6th that I actually... What did you do in the, in the meantime? I just went around camp and I did a little more entertaining, of course, you know, at the special services. I've been uh, doing that ever since, so not entertaining, but just playing my harmonica now, just was a hobby. And I, I wish you'd brought it today. Yeah. <laughs> in in the in the meantime, <laughs> you and the other fellows. Um, I mean, it's on my keychain all the time. <laughs> I before, can play that one before we finish, hang on a second. No, I'm just showing. You, I just got it. I bought. It. I keep it on my keychain. That's one of them. I got about ten others. Okay. All sizes. Did you and the other fellows between the time the war ended and February when you you got to come home? Did you start to think of what you were going to do with the rest of your life? Well, the first thing I figured is I'd go into the airport and try to follow up. I didn't have my, I got a diploma, but I didn't get, what you say, a license. Uh, I wasn't mm -hmm. a licensed mechanic. So what I did was I went over to the Logan Airport to try to get into, you know, in the same field, but they would have so many. At that time, it was, it was only paying 89 cents an hour. And, uh, because that was about the average for that time of the season, the year. And uh, so I finally, I got out of that and I went into, um, back into machine shop work. Okay, let's, let's get you home first. Yeah. Um, you got the word, finally your points are up, you're, you're, you're in the next bunch that's gonna going. Be going right, right. How did you get home? Well, they went home in a victory ship. New York, and then NYU Victory, and I was sick again going home on the, on the Victory ship, which is a much smaller ship. Mm -hmm. And I put on a show, an NYU Victory ship uh, play. It was a show, like a, like a talent show. But I was too sick to even <laughs> figure work on it. As long as I was laying down, I was fine. As soon as I stand up, I had something to eat, I'd get sick again. So. How long did it take you to come home in that? About five or six days, maybe a week. And you came into uh, New York? Right into New York, yeah. I, Tell us about the feeling of coming into New York Harbor after oh, all that. Oh, everybody jump off, of course, get off the ship, was kissing the ground and yeah. all the American soil. When you were in England, did uh, the USO or um, anybody have shows for you folks? Oh yeah, they always managed to have some something going on. We could to shows and different things that were going on. We didn't see anybody like, you know, like Bob Hope or anybody that way. It was overseas there. We didn't get to see those, but they, they did have something going on at times to keep us busy or occupied. At that time, we didn't have you know, much television of much of any kind, so we didn't have that to watch. So we did what we could, you know, and we managed. We used to go to clubs and have activities going for us. Did you get those little paperback books that uh, came out during the war? Uh, I imagine the they had some of them around. Did you read uh, any of those? And somewhat a little bit. Uh, okay. I'm not much of a reader. In fact, that's what I'm, I'm not even belong to the library because I'm not an avid reader. I read the newspaper and things like that, but I don't, I never was, could concentrate or have the patience. Can you? Think about your time in the military, or oh, let's get to where you were discharged. Let's, where, where were you discharged? I think it was Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. oh, mistake. I'm then you took the train up to Boston and you were out. Took the train right, and, and out, right. Hmm. In fact, I adopted a little, when I was over in England, there was a little black cocker spaniel that adopted himself to me. He just came into camp, like they call him Blackie, like myself. He used to come with me everywhere, sleep on the end of my bed. And he was real satin smooth fur, beautiful little dog. And then when I got to leave and get on a truck to go back to the ship to go home, they claimed, they said they couldn't have any animals. And he was running after, it was a hot breaking thing. He was running after the truck to try to get to me. And, and he got out of sight. And then when I got on the ship, they had three or four dogs that people had smuggled over. And I, was, I was, felt like jumping off and getting them. Yeah. Because I kept them for about two years. 
he'd go with me and I fed him, you know, and I made sure he slept at the end of my bed all the time. And it was oh, real that's, nice. That's, that's a sad story. Hmm. Can you think of any most memorable experience of your time in the service? One thing that stands out more than anything else. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was one particularly my cousin, first cousin, was over, also over in England. And in Northampton, we arranged to our mothers. We couldn't communicate. We, we knew we both were there. We couldn't communicate with each other. So through our mothers, we, they found out where we were. We arranged to meet one night in Northampton at the train station. Well, it was St. Anne and St. Francis. And what happened, we didn't mention any, we just said the train station. So what happens is he goes to St. Anne, I went to St. Francis, and we waited all night. And in fact, I talked to some people there, and I met some couple of girls, and we were supposed to have a date, and then he come over to meet me, and he never showed up. He waited in the other one, the other station with me, and I never showed up. So we were, both went back to the same Red Cross Club went to sleep and next morning we figured we'd look for each other somewhere down there and we met in the middle of the street in Northampton, England. And that was a memorable. I sent that into the Reader's Digest. I don't, I don't know if I got a hearing on it or not, but we finally met. It was quite a reunion. We hadn't seen each other for a couple of years. I hope you told your mother. <laughs> mm, do the mother. Yeah. We finally met right in the middle of the street. He was walking back from the station. I was going down to the other station and that's where we met. That it's almost a, almost a miracle, isn't yeah, it, with well, all those right, people? Yeah, right. How about a memorable character, somebody you remember, somebody of all the time? Uh, yeah, this Tommy Hanley was a comedian. Uh, he was like, like Johnny Carson to us, or uh, Bob Hope, or uh, Milton Berle. He was the English comedian. His daughter, Flaming Redhead, I met her, and she took me to see him in the show, and that's when he... First thing he, she introduced me to him, he says, hey, you ain't got any gum. You wanted some gum. <laughs> <laughs> was there a, more than anything else, was there a humorous experience that you remember? Oh, there's several, yeah, quite a few. That, uh, I don't think I remember too many of them, but, you know, being in downtown or being in clubs or, you know, in downtown in London when uh, one time I missed my ride home. We used to have a, a truck that would pick you up, take you back to camp. And I got met some girl, you know, and then the next thing you know, she wants to, they all want to get married to English, to Americans, the Yanks, because they used to watch English movie, American movies, and figured all of that, all of us lived like that. You know, with rich cars and homes and everything else and swimming pools. And they wanted the worst way to get married to Americans is to go back to the States. But, uh, so how often did you get married? Yeah, <laughs> I made several promises, but that's all. But, uh, when you came home, uh, and uh, did you go go into the reserves, or did you join any veterans groups? Oh well, yeah, I belonged to a couple of them. I belonged to BFW and the Jewish War Vets, which I'm still in, belong to. Mm -hmm. And I belonged to the AMVETS. Uh, well, that was later on. I didn't join that right away. But any of the veterans groups that I would get into would, you know, so you'd be recognized as and uh, something to keep busy with. Did you ever have a reunion of the guys from the uh, 100th Bombardment Group? Never. No reunion. Like I mentioned, uh, when I read the day, local paper, there seems to be 95% of reunions of people in the Navy. I don't get too many. I never seen too many of groups that anybody getting together from the infantry or the Air Force or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I never really, never had a reunion. What were you sort of feeling about this uh, vague transitional period where one day you're in the service, you're a soldier, and the next day you're a civilian? How did you feel about that? Mm, quite a different feeling, you know. I got, my, of course, I had my mustering out pay, which was, in fact, I remember taking my kid brother and took him to the store, buy him a pair of shoes because I had some extra money, and I uh, felt like I was, you know, having the money. But then I, my main objective was, what was I going to do for work? Or get a mm -hmm. job or do something? And when I finally got in, knew I had some machine shop experience, then I went to school, 
because I had to support my mother and help my brother was younger. I went to tech. I didn't get to go to high school because I, when I lost my father younger, I had to help out the family. Yes. So I went to technical trade school, which was almost the equivalent. And I learned the machine shop business from that. Instead of, I gave up the idea of trying to be a follow-up airplane mechanic, engine mechanic, and I went to Deccan High School to learn a machine shop game which I did, and then I worked in the Arsenal and Navy Yard. How important to you was serving in the military? Well, I felt as though I had done my part, you know, and I, <clears throat> whether I could have got drafted or not, I, I never really found out, but when I enlisted, I felt, you know, a little sense of importance, feeling of importance. Now, uh, much as I could get it to. And how, how do you feel it might have affected the rest of your life, other than the education you got? Well, I felt, you know, that I was served my country and I was a veteran and I, uh, I had a feeling of, you know, that I had done something to mm -hmm. help out the best I could, even though I didn't do any battle or anything like that. I wasn't in any, never saw any fighting or shooting or anything like that. I had a weapon, but they didn't use it that much. What did you carry? Uh, M14 Grand Rifle. But uh, we used to have a little bit of training, you know, on how to fire and firing range, you know. And of course, they wouldn't let us go to camp unless could go out and uh, leave unless we had our piece all clean. So we'd have to do that before we were able to go out. You were in World War II, and veterans of World War II are beginning to be much celebrated this time. It's the, um, the twilight of veterans that were in that war. What did you think about serving in that particular war as distinct from others that have come afterward? I know I didn't give it too much thought, I guess. I don't know, just, you know what, being in other branches, whatever the other branch of people were, I was as happy to see somebody else was in the other services that, you know, come out. But I was, I had a good feeling. It was something that I did what I could. As, as to have been, been in World War Two. Right, in World War yeah. Two, right. Do you feel that people feel the same way about, uh, say, the Korean War or the Vietnam War? Well, I think it's just a later addition to the veteran services or whatever was and missing in action or Vietnamese or whatever, missing, you know, the Korean veterans or whatever. Well, they're being recognized now as much, but although most of the veterans organizations I belong to now, like the Jewish War Vets or Veterans of Foreign Wars, or most of the people are from World War II. They are, mm -hmm. yeah. Very really, rarely you get one from World War One unless he's a real old timer. How about from Korea or Vietnam or the Gulf War? Not too much. Not too many young fellas that go into that. Do you have any idea why that is? I don't know. Maybe they figure there's too many older people in the in the organization. You were treated well when you came home, if I understand, and went in and mm. got a, a good education. No. Um, do you have any feelings about how fellows were treated or, or the, the women? when they came home from the wars following yours, uh, say Korea or Vietnam? Well, the veteran was uh, treated well, and they, you know, they knew that he gave up his life, a job for his country. So I felt as though I was, you know, not a battle veteran, but at least I was in the service and I did my part to help out. Did you ever take any, uh, receive any veterans' benefits? You said you had some trouble with your ear. Um, yeah, I got the compensation for my you years. You did? How about I, uh, hospitalization or the GI Bill or something <coughs> like that? Well, the GI Bill, I had used that when my mother's trying to buy a house when I didn't live in here. So I couldn't use that at the time, but I, I, gave, I used it for her so she could get a house with my aunt and next door to each other. But I didn't, when I went to buy my own house, I couldn't use it because I had already done it, so I had to get it, go through the FHA. And I 
managed to get to with that all right. Mm -hmm. Right. Is there any anything I haven't asked you today that you'd like to talk about, or is there one overriding thought that you would like to leave on this tape for people to look at years from now about your feelings of being in the military? I don't think there's anything else. I don't think I had any regrets. I didn't have, you know, I was treated well, I was fed well, and I, you know, and back to when I was over in uh, England in Martin Air Base, I developed the measles, and I was in the hospital for 10 days, German measles. And That's appropriate, yeah. Appropriate. Yeah. And we had some other people there, you know, that were in it as well. And other than that, I, uh, I did have a best uh, compensation. I put a bullet in my hand through my own use, but I did get, I got compensated for that, all right. And uh, other than that, we were just working in the hangars and doing our thing, whatever they had to do. It worked well. Okay, Harry, would you like to play your harmonica for us? And the little one? Yeah. <laughs> Just give you a little bit of a tune. I'd like that. There's not too many tunes I can play in it, but it's just small. It's just played. If you know that song, You Want My Sunshine? Sure. That's why we won the war. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.